Okay, here I am on Age of Conan. I promised myself I would finish reading the High Borgen Age. I still have a ways to go. Thankfully, I have 32 gigabyte memory card, so I'm just gonna read and see what happens. Eris was a practical man. He appealed to the savages' sense of material gain. He pointed out the power and splendor of the Hyborian kingdoms as an example of the power of Mitra, whose teachings and works had lifted them up to their high places. And he spoke of cities and fertile plains, marble walls and iron chariots, jeweled towers and horsemen in their glittering armor riding to battle and Gorm with the unerring instinct of the barbarian passed over his words regarding gods and their teachings and fixed on the material powers thus vividly described there in that mud floored waddle hut with a silk rubbed priest on the mahogany block and the dark skinned chief crouching in his tiger hides was laid the foundations of empire as has been said, Eris was a practical man. He dwelt among the Picts and found much that an intelligent man could do to aid humanity, even when that humanity was cloaked in tiger skins and wore necklaces of human teeth. Like all priests of Mitra, he was instructed in many things. He found that there were vast deposits of iron ore in the Pictish hills, and he taught the natives to mine, smelt, and work it into implements, agricultural implements, as he fondly believed. He instituted other reforms, but these were the most important things he did. He instilled in Gorm a desire to see the civilized lands of the world. He taught the Picts how to work in iron, and he established contact between them and the civilized world. At the chief's request, he conducted him and some of his warriors through the Bostonian marches where the honest villagers stared in amazement into the glittering outer world. <coughs> Eris no doubt thought that he was making converts right and left because the Picts listened to him and refrained from smiting him with their copper axes. But the Pict was little calculated to seriously regard teachings which bade him forgive his enemy and abandon the warpath for the ways of honest drudgery. It has been said that he lacked artistic sense. His whole nature led to war and slaughter. When the priest talked of the glories of the civilized nations, his dark-skinned listeners were intent, not on the ideals of his religion, but on the loot which he unconsciously described in the narration of rich cities and shining lands. When he told how Mitra aided certain kings to overcome their enemies, they paid scant heed to the miracles of Mitra, but they hung on the description of battle lines, mounted knights, and maneuvers of archers and spearmen. They hearkened with keen dark eyes and inscrutable countenances, and they went their ways without comment and heeded with flattering intentness his instructions as to the working of iron and kindred arts. Before his coming, they had filched steel weapons and armor from the Bosonians and Zingarans, or had hammered out their own crude arms from copper and bronze. Now a new world opened to them, and the clang of sledges re-echoed throughout the land, and Gorm, by virtue of this new craft, began to assert his dominance over other clans, partly by war, partly by craft and diplomacy, in which latter art he excelled all other barbarians. Picts now came and went freely into Aquilonia under safe conduct, and they returned with more information as to armor forging and sword making. More, they entered Aquilonia's mercenary armies to the unspeakable disgust of the sturdy Bosonians. Aquilonia's kings toyed with the idea of playing the Picts against the Sumerians and possibly thus destroying both menaces, 
but they were too busy with their policies of aggression in the south and east to pay much heed to the vaguely known lands of the west from which more and more stocky warriors swarmed to take service among the mercenaries these warriors their service completed went back to their wilderness with good ideas of civilized warfare and that contempt for civilization which arises from familiarity with it drums began to beat in the hills gathering fires smoked on the heights and savage sword makers hammered their steel on a thousand anvils by intrigues and forays too numerous and devious to enumerate Gorm became chief of chiefs the nearest approach to a king the Picts had had in thousands of years he had waited long he was past middle age but now he moved against the frontiers not in trade but in war Eris saw his mistake too late he had not touched the soul of the pagan in which lurked the hard fierceness of all the ages his persuasive eloquence had not caused a ripple in the Pictish conscience Gorm wore a corslet of silvered mail now instead of the tiger skin but underneath he was unchanged the everlasting barbarian unmoved by theology or philosophy his instincts fixed unerringly on rapine and plunder the picks burst on the Bosonian frontiers with fire and sword not clad in tiger skins and brandishing copper axes as of yore but in scale mail wielding weapons of keen steel as for Eris he was brained by a drunken pit while making a last effort to undo the work he had unwittingly done Gorm was not without gratitude he caused the skull of the slayer to be set on the top of the priest's cairn and it is one of the grim ironies of the universe that the stones which covered Eris's body should have been adorned with that last touch of barbarity above a man to whom violence and blood vengeance above a man to whom violence and blood vengeance were revolting all right that's enough for now <clears throat>